Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, before we begin our worship this morning, I wish to acknowledge the presence of the Lord our God giving this place with us. Also, wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet, the Yagara and Turbo peoples, as well as the elders, past, present, and emerging. And now we have the lighting of the Christ King. Call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me to water in places of repose. He renews my life, he guides me in white paths as befits his name. Though I walk through the valley of deepest darkness, I fear no harm, for you are with me. You spread a table for me in full view of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My drink is abundant. And my goodness and steadfast love shall pursue me for all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for many long years. Amen. And now we have our first hymn, The Lord's My Shepherd. You are the rock of our salvation. 
your steadfast love endures from generation to generation. Lord God Almighty, you are our good shepherd. Because of your guidance and providence, we want for nothing. You lead us to green pastures. You guide us to still waters. You bring comfort when we walk through valleys of darkness. You anoint us with abundance. May your goodness and steadfast love pursue us all the days of our lives. May we forever dwell in your presence. Lord our God, we give you thanks and praise. We give thanks for this day and this time that we can gather together in peace in your name to worship together. We give thanks for this community of faith at Windsor United Church. We give thanks for their faithfulness and continued service. We give thanks for our lives, for the ways you have blessed us individually and collectively. We give thanks for the blessings we see and for those we don't see, for all blessings, great and small. Lord our God, you have called us to listen for your still, small voice whispering through the noise of the world around us. But we confess that, like the man and woman in Eden, we have followed what we have seen more than what we have heard. We have been caught up in appearances and external expectations more than your voice calling to us from within our hearts. In doing so, we have cast shame on others and ourselves. For all this and more, we ask for your forgiveness. And still, O oh Lord, you continue to call us out into the open to shower us in compassion and mercy. Lord our God, we hold in our silent prayers the people on our hearts in need of rest and sustenance at this time. God of light, we hold in our silent prayers the people on our hearts who need guidance at this time. God of all comfort, we hold in our silent prayers the people on our hearts who are grieving and afraid. Welcoming God, we hold in our silent prayers the people on our hearts who are weighed down by conflict and opposition. Jesus, light of the world, send forth your goodness and hope into all the world. Lord our God, we dedicate to you our lives, not just what is apparent to others, but also our hearts. May our hearts of stone be turned into hearts of flesh. May the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We pray all these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who taught us to pray and say, Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you. Feel free to share a time of peace with your neighbors. Please be with you.
morning, everybody. Come to our Bible readings for this morning. Our first Old Testament reading is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through to 13. Samuel the night's day. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go if Saul hears about me? He will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the ten trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord anoints, anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinad, and, and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by. But Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Rome. Our Gospel reading this morning is taken from John chapter 9, verses 1 through to 41. Jesus here was a man born to God. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent him, who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, washing the pool of Siloam. So that so the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbours and those who had formerly seen him begged, begging and asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. For he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. The Pharisees investigated the healing. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, 
Hating a sinner performs such signs, so they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight, until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it now that he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or open his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders, who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age to ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they held insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, No, that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth, how dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? the man asked. Tell me so that, I, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were there with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus says, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you see, your guilt remains. This is the living word of God. Thanks be to God. Um, 
I couldn't make it any smaller, so I think it'll still work. It's also in Louise's weekly, um, month, quarterly uh, booklet. There was a soft copy of that. If that's a step too far, I've got some hard copies, but you'll have to give them to someone to enter into the survey online. But just let me know if you'd like a hard copy of the survey. And last but not least, thank you to Sam, who's been filling in for this week and last week while Louise is away. It's been a pleasure having you as always. We love having you come and speak to us. That's all the announcements this week. Now I'm time to Conviction, 
But Saul will prove to be none of these things. Saul will go against God's direct commands. He would have his kingship rejected by God. And later, he would die in disgrace. Appearances can deceive, but God sees the heart. Appearances, appearance and reality were opposites. Saul had physical but not moral stature. And it seems to be a similar story with David's older brothers. Eliab in particular is described in very similar terms to Saul, but God had already rejected him. And we may guess because of his heart. If we take this insight all the way back to the beginnings of Genesis, to Adam and Eve, we can understand that that story is about the eyes and the ears, about seeing and failing to listen. Adam and Eve let what they saw override what they heard. Judged by appearances, and we will miss the deeper truth about the situations, about situations and people. We will even miss God himself, for God cannot be seen, only heard. Appearances deceive, clothes betray. Deeper understanding whether of God or human beings cannot come from appearances alone. In order to choose between what is right and wrong, between good and bad, we must make sure that we not only look, but also listen. Listening is a way to look past appearances, to examine what lies beneath. Listening for the music beneath the noise. I believe in many ways our contemporary culture is very much a culture of the eye. Not to say we are influenced by what we hear, but how we appear, how we dress, how others dress and sing to us is of paramount importance. We have to look the part, fake it until you make it, keep up appearances, don't lose face. Not all that glitters is gold. Shiny veneers can betray an unstable foundation. Appearances can say one thing, but the heart underneath it can say something else. Talking about appearances and reality, I think is similar to understanding why we do what we do. Growing up in our church, we always did things a certain way. Our worship followed a certain pattern. Our singing followed the fit a certain mold. There were things we did and other things we didn't do. Likewise with cultural practices and rituals. But with all these things we can ask, why do we do what we do? Sometimes we know, but perhaps sometimes we don't fully know. We just do it because that's the way we've always done it. We forget the why behind the, behind the how and the what. We forget the wisdom behind the practice, the reason we do it in the first place. In those cases, we look at the appearance, but forget the heart. But we can always ask, what are the deeper principles of a practice? What are the broader aims of a ritual? Why do we do what we do? What is at the heart of it? The difference between the eyes and the ears mirrors, I think, the difference between shame cultures and guilt cultures. In shame cultures, the highest value is honor. In guilt cultures, it is righteousness. Shame is feeling bad that we have failed to live up to the expectations others have of us. Guilt is what we feel when we fail to live up to what our own conscience demands of us. Shame is other-directed. Guilt is inner-directed. Shame cultures are also very, very visual. Shame itself has to do with how you appear, or how you imagine you appear in other people's eyes. The instinctive reaction to shame is to wish you were invisible. Or somewhere else. Guilt, by contrast, is much more internal. You can't escape it by being invisible or being somewhere else. Your conscience accompanies you wherever you go, regardless of how you are seen by others. Guilt cultures are cultures of the ear, not the eye. Shame cultures focus on seeing and appearances. Guilt cultures focus on listening, on the internal reality. Human beings can easily stop at the appearance, but God always sees the heart. God has looked into the hearts of all of Jesse's sons and found them wanting. The only one with the right heart to be king is David, and David was the youngest son. Later on, God will say that David is a man after his own heart. Appearances can be invited, but they can betray us. 
Samuel is judging by his eyes, but he's also listening with his ears. He sees the external appearance, but also has the voice of God to guide him. He looks, but also listens. We can't run away from the guilt that we face. Guilt has nothing to do with appearances and everything to do with the conscience, the voice of God in the human heart. Guilt can't be escaped by hiding. Your conscience can't be outrun. God's voice can't be ignored forever by ignoring it. A guilt ethic is about the inner voice that tells you that is right and that is wrong, as clearly as that is true and that is false. But a shame ethic is about social convention. It's a matter of meeting or not meeting the expectations others have of you. By social convention, Saul and Eliab, David's eldest brother, both fit the bill for a king. Their appearances are that of a traditional image we have of a king, but not so their hearts. Shame cultures are essentially cultures of social conformity. They belong to groups where socialization takes the form of internalizing the values of the group, such that you feel shame, an acute form of embarrassment when you break them, knowing that if people discover what you have done, you will lose honor and lose face. So do we focus on the clothing, the outward display, or do we focus on what lies beneath the surface? Do we want people who look the part or people who can play the part? Is our key value appearance, how we seem to others, or is it something else altogether, a willingness to heed the will of God? Choosing between what our eyes see and what our ears hear I think is the difference between choosing between the appearances of people and the hearts of people. With our eyes we can see the outward appearance, but with our ears and our listening we might get a deeper look into the heart underneath. As Jesus taught his disciples, what comes out of our mouths comes from our heart. And we might even rephrase God's words in the reading from 1 Samuel. The Lord doesn't see the way humans see. Humans look at the outward appearance but the Lord listens to the heart. It takes training, focus, and the ability to create silence in the soul to learn how to listen, whether to God or a fellow human being. Seeing shows us the beauty of the created world, but listening creates us to the, to the soul of another, and sometimes to the soul of the other. God, as he speaks to us, calls to us, summoning us to our task in the world. If I were asked how to find God, I would say, learn to listen. Listen to the song of the universe in the call of the birds, the rustle of trees, the crash and heave of the waves. Listen to the poetry of prayer, the music of the Psalms. Listen deeply to those you love and those who you love. Those who love you, I should say. Listen to the words of God in the Bible and hear them speak to you. Listen to their intimations and inflections. Don't worry about how you look or how others look. The world of appearances is a world of masks, disguises and deceptions. Listening is not easy. In fact, it can be incredibly difficult. But listening alone bridges the abyss between soul and soul, self and other, I and the divine. So may we follow not only what our eyes see, but also what our ears hear. May we not only look at the outward appearance, but also listen to the heart beating underneath it. Amen. Now we have our third, or well, our final hymn, I should say, Joyful, Joyful.
May the Lord make his face shine on you and show you his favor. May the Lord lift up his face toward you and give you peace.